So tell me a little bit about your presentation earlier today. Yeah, so I was presenting today my collaborative work with Jun So Kong and my advisor, Janayat Sitar, on a diver approach. So basically the problem of when you have an AUV and a diver working together underwater, uh, it's important that they be close together when they want to communicate, whether it's for, you know, doing gestures to the AUV to tell it, you know, go do this task, go look at this area. Or if it's the AUV talking to the diver, maybe they're telling it, hey, I found this cool thing over here, you should come check it out. In either of those situations, you need to be close together, right? However, for AUVs to be useful underwater, they need to leave the diver. They need to go do searching and, you know, carrying item or, or tools and materials and stuff like that. Uh, so this is the problem that we have, right? We need to be close to talk, but we need to be far away to, to do stuff. So to fix this, we need a capability for diver approach. We need to be able to search for the diver, find them, and approach them to an appropriate distance and orientation for communication. So our algorithm is called ADROC, Autonomous Diver Relative Operator Configuration. And it's this uh, monocular vision-based method of doing this, where we, uh, we do this uh, diver approach based on only monocular vision, because we wanted to keep it as cheap as possible. You know, no, no sonar, no stereo vision, um, and, and as minimal sensing as we could, we could manage this with. Uh, and basically the way the algorithm works is instead of trying to do monocular depth estimation, which is, you know, you can get decent accuracy on it, but you sometimes need high computational power. Instead of doing that, we realized, okay, what we actually need to know is, is the distance that the diver is currently at good enough? Is it close enough for, for us to work with the communication part, part of things? You need a rough estimate. Yeah, you need, you need a very rough general estimate. I don't care if the, if the robot's, you know, one meter away or 1.1, 1 .1, you know, 0 0.9, 0 0.7. It doesn't really matter to me as long as it's close enough, yeah. rough enough. So the way that we did this is by using shoulder width as a prior piece of information because we know from biomedical literature that there's a range that human shoulder widths come in. We know the average of that range. We know, you know, where most people's shoulder widths are pretty close to. Um, from that, we can calculate the expected pixel width between shoulders for a close enough rough estimate distance for communication. Yeah. And then we just compare, is the diver's shoulder width smaller than that? Okay, we need to come closer. Is it, is it larger than that? Okay, we need to back up. And the way we do the, uh, the actual calculation of the shoulder width is a two-step process. We either use a diver detector, which takes an image of, a, of the scene and finds the diver, draws a bounding box around them. We can use the width of that as kind of a proxy for shoulder width, uh, but it's not super accurate, right? The diver could be kind of on their side. Yeah. Uh, there's lots of things that can change the bounding box width without changing shoulder width. So that gets us a very, very rough estimate. And if we just approached based on that, the, the AUV would be way off on distance because the bounding box changes a lot. What doesn't change a lot is the actual shoulder width. That remains the same. So we also use the diver pose estimation algorithm to get key points on the shoulders and calculate the distance between them. Yeah. And so it's this cascaded approach where basically what ends up happening is from far away, the detector works. We've actually run this as far as 15 meters away. Um, and that lets you center the diver in the image and start getting closer to them. And then as you get closer within the range of, I would say probably about six to seven meters is the effective range. Uh, you can actually start detecting the key points for the shoulders and then you get accurate distance, not distance estimation, but distance ratio calculation. We call this the pseudo distance. Yeah. It's not really distance, but it functions as it. Yeah, so I mean, one of the nice things that you said in uh, your presentation is that even in different poses and orientations, mm -hmm. the space between your shoulders stays relatively the same. Yeah. But on the flip side, say my shoulders and your shoulders mm -hmm. have different lengths. They are different. But when you look at the magnitude of the difference compared to the magnitude of the scene, it's actually very small, right? Like I would say just on a rough guess, I'd say the difference between our shoulder width is a few centimeters, right? And when you were using this, uh, I can't remember my exact shoulder width, it was something like 40 something centimeters. I, I don't remember. Um, when we're using that as our, as our, basically our signal for the distance, um, a difference of a couple of centimeters does make a difference, but it doesn't wreck things. We can still work with it. And, and like I said in the, in the uh, presentation earlier, we can run it off of the average diver shoulder width, 
But if you are going down with an AUV and you know you're going to work with it, you could also calibrate it to your exact shoulder width. We did this um, a few times and it works. The algorithm works regardless. If you calibrate it to your exact shoulder width, you can get really nice distance, uh, like final distance for approach. Yeah. Um, it works really nicely if you calibrate it to the specific shoulder width, but it works generally on the average as well. Is there any difference between, say, taking these, uh, these measurements and images above ground versus underwater? Mm. Water distort that measurement? Yeah, so absolutely. Underwater vision in general, there's distortion of color, there's distortion of turbidity, particulate matter and bubbles, lots of things. So, so this side of underwater vision is kind of, um, it is the way it is. All underwater vision stuff suffers from this. There is a, a really lively thread of work on underwater image enhancement, which mostly attempts to deal with like uh, light or color changing. Color, yeah. yeah. Um, so that actually, it helps a bit, but doesn't help a ton with this. Um, the other big thing, so, so that's from the visual side of things. When we're talking more about the, uh, I don't know quite how to say this, the, the, the learning side of things. Our diver detector is trained on images of divers, so it knows what they look like, it approaches them easy. The body pose estimator that we use is TRT pose from uh, NVIDIA IoT. It's trained on terrestrial imagery. So the thing about that is that in those terrestrial images, people are standing or sitting. Nobody is sideways, right? Because we, we can't go sideways. But in the water, we can. People are sideways all the time. They're swimming, they're floating. And so this actually causes problems with ad rock. Um, it's, uh, if, if somebody is in a, a vastly different orientation, um, it, it, it's a lot harder, which is why, you know, if you read the paper, you'll see we, we made a couple of simplifying assumptions. One of them was that there's only one diver in the scene because while we're looking into uh, discriminating between divers, right now the algorithm doesn't do that. So, and it'll approach whichever one it sees first. Um, the other simplifying assumption that we made was that the diver is generally upright. You know, we didn't tell people you would have to stay 100% straight up and down, but we said, you know, stay mostly upright. Yeah. And when we tried it on people, you know, sideways, it still does work, but not as well. Yeah. So this is an area that's like, you can definitely see a path to improvement. Absolutely. It's not really a challenge, it's just a matter of getting the data in. It yeah, uh, with underwater robotics, ground truth is always a huge, huge trouble. And for labeling something like pose, that is some really, it's, it's not so much that it's like difficult work, but the labeling is going to take months for that. Yeah. But I actually, I mean, it, this is why ICRA is great. Like I was talking with somebody on Monday night or no, Saturday, Sunday night. Um, and they were telling me about some pose network I should try. So I'm going to go home and try try it for our data and see if it works any better. Yeah. Um, I think the two main areas of improvement, three, three areas of improvement. Pose estimation we already talked about. Yeah. Second big one is uh, search behavior. Our search behavior for this was really simple. If you don't see the diver, turn, mm -hmm. right? But there's, there's some obvious improvements that can be made there. Things like if we lose track of the diver, we should turn in the direction that we last saw them, yeah. right? Or if we're trying to cover a large space, maybe turning isn't going to be enough. You know, I, I said earlier, we, we ran this from 15 meters away. I would guess, I don't have data, I would guess that past 30 meters, it's not going to work because we just can't see anything. So for a space that's like 30 meters or larger, which open water, underwater environments are, um, you're going to need to be able to do more than just turning. It's going to need to like search the space somehow. Yeah. That I think is the whole big thing on its own. Um, and then the other big thing on its own is uh, what I said earlier about diver discrimination. Yeah. Being able to tell the difference between diver A and diver B. You know, I don't, I don't really care if it's, you know, this guy versus that guy versus that girl. It doesn't matter who specifically, but I do want the algorithm to be able to manage multiple divers in the scene, knowing which one it's tr approached before. And, and when we actually first came up with this idea, the idea was we're going to turn on the robot and it's going to like go up to everybody and ask, hey, are you my operator? <laughs> and I really want to do that still. So I, if we get the diver discriminator working uh, well enough. And that will be through gesture. Say, like, yeah. So, it, know, well, so, so it'll come up to the diver and it'll do like a, so I, I've done this work with uh, motion-based communication, robot yeah. communication via motion. Um, and it, so the, the robot's going to come up and it's going to kind of do like a, you ever seen like a dog ask to play fetch with you? It's going to kind of go like, hey, 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 are you, are you? 
and then uh, the diver will say yes or or no. I'm not your I'm not your operator, and then it'll go okay. I'll cross you off the list. Search for the next person. Yeah. That's where this work hopefully goes in the future. Um, you know my my work in general, my thesis work is about robot communication and interaction underwater, uh, which I think I mentioned this briefly in the talk. You know, underwater human robot collaboration is a brand new field. Yeah. Like this didn't exist before the early 2000s, um, partially because the AUVs that are reasonable to, co to work with underwater are like since 2000s. They were, they were created in the 2000s. And that was yes. the impetus for why now working with a robot right. underwater water is even a concept that we're talking about. Yes, because the first AUVs are in like the 60s, and these are these big ocean-going submarine things that are for oceanography. Great work, you know, really important stuff, but they're bigger than you and I are. Yeah. And you can, you can interact with that, but it's not really what they're for. They're for doing yeah. these long deployments that humans can't do. We're now in, in underwater robotics seeing uh, the, the advent, the coming of um, collaborative AUVs. It is, it is a new thing that is coming up, and you can see it in the work. You know, underwater HRI papers weren't written 20 years ago. Um, maybe somebody wrote one 20 years ago that I don't know about, and they're going to get mad at me, but uh, I've only seen one dating back to early 2000s. Um, and now there's, there's a few here and there. I've presented a couple at ICRA now, and... While we're not yet at the point where the AUVs and the people are actually working together, um, you know, I, I, I don't know of anybody who's actually doing collaborative work with AUVs for like a company, um, but it's coming. Yeah. It's coming soon. And, and in particular for me, I'm really interested in like environmental conservation and biological remediation. So like trash cleanup, oil spills, uh, uh, observing invasive, or, uh, so it's either eradicating invasive species or preserving endangered species. Yeah. This kind of thing where what's happening right now is around the world, some scientist is diving, yeah. you know, they're diving with all these undergrads for hours long a day. I want to be able to give them robots that are cheap and, and openly available. And, you know, my big part of it is robots that they can communicate with in a way that's not onerous for them to learn. I don't want these scientists to have to learn Python, to have to learn C++ or ROS and learn how to program these robots. I want them to be able to use my communication frameworks, my task management frameworks, so that they can task these AUVs with different pieces of work. Go find me this, this type of marine life. Go find me this trash. Tell me where to go pick up this trash. Uh, bring me tools. Carry samples for me. Yeah. This kind of stuff, I think, is very much within the realm of possibility. And the work that I and the other uh, great PhD students and un master students and undergrad students and our advisor over the Interactive Robotics and Vision Lab do is actively moving us towards that. Yeah. We're getting, you know, perception capabilities, navigation, mapping capabilities. You saw in the marine robotics talks all these different things, you know, the acoustic localization, the, uh, the GoPro-based yeah. vision for, um, for mapping, all this stuff. It's all pieces of the puzzle. And the piece that I'm most interested in is the human-robot interaction part because it's, it's such an interesting, challenging environment. There's so many assumptions that you make terrestrially that just aren't there. Like, the big, the, the, you know, if you're communicating with a robot, you kind of expect to talk to it and have it talk back. You can't do that underwater. You gotta, yeah. you gotta, there's no voice. There's no voice. There's a breathing apparatus yeah. in your mouth. And you can hear, but not really well. So I, I've developed, you know, motion, light-based communication. I'm trying sound, but uh, nonverbal sound. So like tones instead of words. Yeah. And what's interesting, too, is like, you know, as there's a lot of industry examples, like mm -hmm. offshore wind and like offshore structures yes. that are being built, uh, where the divers are not going to get replaced. No, no, no time soon. A, yeah. They have such a incredibly difficult job to automate. Yes. That, and because of that, they're also they're hard to find. Yep. Must be expensive. Yep. Um, it's dangerous, too. And dangerous. People yeah. die every year. So you don't, you, you want to do everything you can to make that diver the most efficient version of themselves. Yes. Possible. Efficient and safe and, and uh, easier. Yep. You know, it's, it's, it is hard work. It, like you said, it's hard to find people who do this because there's lots of scuba dive certified people, right? It's a, it's a common pastime, but... 
technical diving and diving for, for commercial purposes, there's not too many of them out there. There's, I mean, in, in, in the grand scheme of things, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a rarer field and so much important work is, is in there. I, there's this quote I really love. Um, it's a, I, I don't know if it's actually, it's attributed to Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, water is the driving force of all life on our planet. I really believe that. Like, obviously, there's the, the scientific reasons, you know, photosynthesis, climate, climate stuff, but also just like so much commerce depends on ocean environments, the internet. I mean, we have cables yeah. undersea, all of this stuff. You need AUVs. There are some places where we want to replace divers with AUVs, but we really want to augment the divers who are currently doing work underwater with AUVs, with these collaborative AUVs, partially because you're right, it's going to be a long time before they're replaced, if ever. It's such a challenging field. But also, um, personally, I'm, I, I really like the idea of robots making people's lives better. And sometimes replacing them in jobs is the way towards that. There are some jobs that are just so dangerous, so dull, so, so dirty, that you don't want anybody to do that. But there's a lot of jobs where like people depend on this for their livelihood. I don't want to replace these people. I want to make their lives easier. I want to make their lives easier and I want to make it possible for them to do more interesting work. You know, there's, we, we think about, we think of ourselves as such an advanced society, right? Like we go to space, we go to Mars. A ridiculous amount of our ocean is unexplored. Yeah. A ridiculous, we, we don't know how so much of the life that exists in our ocean is we don't we there's so much basic science there that's undone because the environment is so inhospitable you need air tanks there's pressure considerations there's a maximum limit you can dive to so anything that you're doing underwater is automatically 100 times harder 100 times more costly more effortful and this is where auvs my advisor said this really really well in the session so we want to enhance underwater divers by having underwater divers do the things AUVs can't and having AUVs do the things underwater divers can't. Yeah. I think that's a perfect summation of where this field is headed. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, no problem, thank you for asking me.